It's up. It's up. We live. We live. Coming at you live and direct. All the text messages have went out. Let's see what's going on in Giami Journeyland. Because I know some of y'all are just probably sleeping. I'm sorry for the lateness of my show. But y'all know how it go down. We doing Nation Builder. I had, I think, about three different meetings and events all popping off at once. And I, you know, thank God for the team over at the Millennium Community School because they made it possible for me to be able to do it. Filled in for me where I couldn't be. You know what I'm saying? Family, yes, that's why family is so important. But just to get just to get it started, you know what I'm saying? Once again, those people that's tuning in on Facebook, I apologize for being late. I'm doing some nation builder business, trying to get things popping off. Y'all know those lines are open. But as we usually do about this time, let's get it started. Ujamaa, 
right? Great Ujamaa to each and every last one of y'all. I want to thank you for joining us on Giami Journey as we will run through these proverbs on tribal quotes. So you are now listening to Giami Journey Media. That's right. It's a heart of a summer production, and you are now listening to Tribal Quotes. But we strive to do nothing but blow up those old paradigms. Because it's the old paradigms that's holding us prisoner, family. Now, I constantly tell y'all, in the morning, I say, hey, find, find some examples of the principles. So today, so today, right, I got to see. Ujama in action, right? Ujama, cooperative economics. Now, I want you to understand. I keep on stressing that I want us to get beyond just the, the 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 money definition of economics. Economics is the science of resources. How does the resources flow? It tell you how your resources flowing, right? So today, right, I had to take a group of kids. To, uh, to the urban gyms for a meeting. And while I was gone, a meeting was called and I wasn't able to attend. So my brothers called me and started handling business. I walk into one of my brothers and, and he's sitting down talking with the family member, hashing things out. And then he goes into the another room with me to take the meeting on. But then I had the nation building meeting at 6 because we're planning for the Malcolm X Festival on May 19th from 12 to 8 p.m. We have some entertainment and some of y'all going to be getting to Texas to come out. And also, I'm going to be asking you for your support. So I will be sending the link so that people can support because we still got to raise these funds right now. So here we go. So one of my brothers would actually, let me say, three of my brothers stepped up for me. Right then, I had a meeting that I had to go to the nation builder meeting. Then I had to go pick up, I had to go pick up Cleve, and I also had to pick up Sasha. My mom dropped Sasha off for me. Right, knock that out. Right, resources just working, it's working. People see that I'm, I'm doing things, and then then a the sister went and picked up the kids, and I dropped off because she saw that I was in a collective. You know what I'm saying? We got Ujima and Ujima in work, at work. You know what I'm saying? In in in, in my life. Now, hopefully some of y'all got some models that you could you could focus on because a lot of times these statistics they often pull us to a point where we see what we lacking. But family, we got to activate these reticular formations so that we can start finding those things that are working for us. And today I got to see the principles in action, and I won't, you know what I'm saying, without giving up family business, because you know nobody wins when the family feuds, right? We falling out because we don't know the rules. Caught up in these institutions. Somebody stole our tools, right? So we need to start activating our tools. And I mean, it, 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 was, it was a marvelous day, a long day, but a marvelous day. And now we are here right now so that we can start discussing. So anybody want to call in, hit me up at 614-556-4535. Once again, that's 614-556-4535. For those out there in Spreaker land, I want to thank y'all. You know what I'm saying? Make sure that you call in as well. The number is 614 614- Five five six four five three five. So now, without any further ado, let's go on and break into the proverbs of the day. And I'm gonna run through them. Nobody joins, then hey, that's cool. Uh, but I do appreciate those that listen as well. So today we on day twenty one. For those that want to support the journey, we got the Giami Journey Workbook. As you see, my book is. Is old and, and beat up, and I didn't write this. I compiled this, right? I wrote the intro, right? I compiled this. This was uh, a process that I put myself through, and I challenge everybody out there, especially those that's talking about joining Giami, those that's talking about joining Tawi. We have to start documenting our journey. If this means that we got to compile some stuff, 
and put our own thoughts down. We have to start. We have to become authorities. Right? What is the key word in authority? The key word in authority is author. Right? So we got to start writing our futures, family. You know what I'm saying? If you ain't doing nothing but keeping a diary, but I'll challenge you to compile or write something. And then, you know what I'm saying? At your own pace. And put it out. Because we have to we have to become the authorities of our story. The stories that we tell. We have to become the authorities of the information that we use. We got to be able to share our thoughts and grow together. Even if sometimes that means we're going to disagree. Because I don't mind disagreeing. You know what I'm saying? You know, but like I said, nobody win when the family feud, right? So now, let's look at these proverbs for the day. So those that want to um, support is Giami Journey Workbook, Tribal Quotes, by compiled by Brother Hatim Giami. You can go to giamijourney.com, look in the top tabs, you'll see Giami Journey Workbook. Click on it, it'll take you straight to the site where you can buy it, and those of you that's in the journey... You know what I'm saying? All of you, my daily toasters, those that's toasting with me. You know what I'm saying? I got the PDF. I own it. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, support with your eyes or support with your cash. I don't care. Just support. You know what I'm saying? So now, one of the things I want to mention is, once again, I will be posting up links so that you can help us with this Malcolm X celebration is very important, family. I need to stress this. We are in the midst of building and rebuilding a culture. And when the, some, one of the most important things in the culture is holidays or holy days, right? Malcolm X celebration is coming up. Kwanzaa is coming up. Marcus Garvey's birthday is coming up. Queen Mother's More Day is coming up. We just passed the Equinox. You know what I'm saying? We got the Equinox. We got Juneteenth. We got a whole bunch of stuff coming up. And these holidays are more than just for us to go out and, 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 and shop. Are more than just for us to, 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 uh, to gather. They are cultural stabilizers. Every culture needs to be stable. There needs to be something that's stable. And on a yearly basis, we have to be able to come together and see the fruits of our labor. And this is why I'm going to be posting up the links, because Malcolm X is one of these days. Malcolm X celebration is one of these days, and I'm challenging you, family. I'm saying, listen, dig in your pockets so that we can do this. Now, also, this, this Kaumba, right? For those that don't know the date, I, I'm thinking, what's the day? The day is the 22nd. On the 24th, because I don't want to do no push-ups. On Kaumba, 324, that's this weekend, from 2 to 5, we will be showing... Um, school days, school days, right? And we will be having a discussion, and it's a fundraiser for the Malcolm X Festival family. So, hey, it's going down. We're building. We're moving towards our goal. Our goal right now is somewhere around three thousand dollars for the Malcolm X Festival. And man, do we got some good entertainment? You know what I'm saying? Do we have some stuff available for the kids? Yes, yes, yes. Vendors will be there. Food vendors will be there. Your cousins going to be there. Your brothers and your sisters going to be there. Let's come together. Let's celebrate together. Let's greet each other. Let's get to know each other. Let's start networking. Let's use these events as an opportunity for us to grow. All right? Let me make sure nobody on the line because I don't want to leave nobody out of the conversation. Because sometimes they won't let me know. Are we up? I guess. I hope we up. All right. So here we go, family. First proverb. Day 21. This is from Henry Frederick Emil. Doing easily what others find difficult is talent. Doing what is impossible for talent is genius. Doing this call is being recorded. Doing easily. What others find difficult is talent. Doing what is impossible for talent is genius. We just was joined by um, somebody from Columbus. Who on the line? Alona Everett. Elder Alona came on. How you doing? Are you just listening I'm in good. or you want to join the conversation? 
Say that again. Are you are you coming? You come? Are are you just listening in, or do you want to join the conversation? Right now, I'm just listening in. Okay. So the first proverb we're working on is doing easily what others find difficult is talent. Doing what is impossible for talent is genius. Proverb number two. This one is from Paramahasa Yogananda. The season of failure is the best time for sowing the seeds of success. Hot damn. Oh my God. I'm going to tear that one up. Last one. Gossip is like a disease. Once you have caught it, it is hard to get rid of it. East Africa. Family, we got three proverbs. That can change your life. All you got to do is be open for the process. All you got to do is be open for the process. Be open for the discussion. Be willing to share. So those of you that's out there, you know what I'm saying? If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have anything, just post it up. I got I got my Spreaker channel open. I got Facebook open. We, we on the phone lines. You call in with the questions. Let's communicate. All right? Because all these are my opinions. And my opinion is not complete. You know why? Because your opinion is not in there. And you never know. The wisdom that you have may be what somebody out there listening to us, whether they're listening live tonight or 100 years from now, may need. So don't hide your wisdom. All right, so, Elder, El, Elder, Elder Alona, I need a favor. Oh, okay. You need a what? I need a favor. You ready? <laughs> Yes. Pick a number between one and three. Okay, you want me to tell you the number? Yes, ma'am. Two. You was thinking about the number two. I'm incredible. I'm, oh, man. How did I know that? <laughs> now, we're going to start with number two. She picked two. So we're going to start with the one I wanted to save for last. But since the elder picked it, we're about to tear this one up. Parman, Parman. Hansa Yogananda, the season of failure is the best time for sowing the seeds of success. Y'all ready, family? My opinion. Hold on. But first, I got to crack this bottle of this ambrosia. Y'all know, know that when I'm brewing, I got to have me some ambrosia. Let's see if it's going to see what it does. We already know what it's going to do. Those of y'all that has been joining me on Facebook, we know what it's going to do. All right, here we go. Let's see. All right, speaker, if you're not watching, it's... Uh-oh, this one settled down nicely. Oh, there it go. It's bubbling up. It's bubbling up. Oh, yeah. Y'all see that? That's a lie. So now, let me pour me a nice little glass. This is that ginseng. I should have mixed it up a little bit before I drank it. Y'all can... I should have brought a, a lot of glass so that y'all can see what's going on. Y'all see the head on it, right? I'm not playing with this brew family. Listen, I just posted up something about gut health and family. Listen, I just came up with the angle for us, right? Spiritual technology. Spiritual technology. We just was joined by Miss Tracy, and I want to welcome you. Now, so here we go. Number two. The season of failure is the best time for sowing the seeds of success. Brother Kwame is on there. You did not give her much of a choice. You said to pick a number between one and two, and there's only exactly. one. <laughs> I said one and three, I thought I said. You did, but the only number between one and three is two. I was just showing y'all how incredible my mental capabilities was. I was, you. I mean, I. You know, who else could guess a number between one and three but me? And I was successful because I was right, wasn't I, Elder? I was right. So I got all these. Yes, you were right. Thank you. And then Kwame going to call me a big dummy. I am, that's, yeah. All right, but here we go, family. The season of failure is be is the best time for sowing the seeds of success. Uh, sowing the seeds of success. All right, Miss Tracy, do you want me to hit that first, or are you gonna hit that one first? Um. Well, what I get from it is one of those. Um, I've already even remember the other proverb, but it's something along the lines of. Um, 
it's better to look where you slip than where you fail. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And it, re it reminds me of that because when we fail, instead of, you know, sucking it up, we need to go ahead. I mean, instead of, you know, sulking it up, I should say, instead of doing all the crying or whatever, we need to take what's good from it. What did we learn from it? If we had a business that failed, instead of thinking about, oh, it failed and crying over it, why don't we think about what could actually happen in it so we can take it to the next venture? So that's what I get from it. Go ahead, Miss Tracy. Now, hold on. Before I get into it, Brother Nuba says spiritual technology sounds fascinating. Please tell us more. All right, now, so we know that all these fields around us have, in a sense, been conquered and, in a sense, mastered, right? We could get into the technology field, but it's going to be very hard for us to squeeze in and be able to compete. You know what I'm saying? We can try to build cars, but it's going to be very hard for us to get in and really compete. We can try to conquer all these other things, but one thing that we have in our community is spiritual technology. What is spiritual technology? Helping people become whole, right? What are the processes that we can master? What are the processes that we could develop that can help people find their way to wholeness? Because with all this technology, with all this comfort that people are in, people are looking for meaning. And one of the things that we can provide as a community, as a tribe, as a people, is ways for people to find that wholeness. That's spiritual technology, right? And it's like, it's so much stuff out there that people are not really exploring that we can look into. Ambrosia, spiritual technology. Divination, spiritual technology. Rites of passage, spiritual technology. You know what I'm saying? We look at it as a science we apply methods that will help us be able to break it down and put it in a process where individuals can have their individual experience, their individual contact with that higher part of themselves so that they can become whole. And in becoming whole, right, we bring value to their life. And in us bringing value into their life, they will bring value to us. Whether they go, you know what I'm saying? It's... it's, it's is 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 simple. When we provide value for people, people provide value for us. So in some form or fashion, they're going to repay us, right? So I mean, I'm just saying. You know, what I'm saying they they used to call them temples back in the day. I'm just throwing it out there. So now, um, Sister Tracy, that was great. Here we go. So now this is my perspective. The season of failure is the best time. All right, the season of failure. In this culture, one of the things that they push us away from. Is the concept of failure. They push us away from it. And we push ourselves away from it. And we're very harsh in our community about failure. You know what I'm saying? About somebody not being immediately good at stuff. Not realizing that in order to master something, you have to mess up. The only way that you move towards success. One of the things I always say is that the bricks on the road to success are made from the dust of our failures. Right. And a lot of times because we don't give our children or ourselves the room to fail. You know what I'm saying? We believe in failure is not our option. Excellence. Perfection. You know what I'm saying? We rob people. We rob ourselves of the opportunities to be able to actually go to the next level. Because oftentimes, if you look back in your own life, many times when you thought you had failed. You know what I'm saying? And you really and you and you really look back and you be honest with yourself. Many times when you thought you had failed or when you failed, oftentimes that gave you the springboard to move to the next victory. So when we fall down, our ancestors are giving us feedback. When we fall down, the universe is giving us feedback. When we fail, the universe is giving us feedback. Not feedback saying stop. Feedback telling you how to do it right the next time. And each time we fail, we try to do it over and over again till we get it right. That's how it works, family. And for some reason, we have stripped this out of our culture. We don't provide our young people with places where they feel comfortable enough to fail. And I want to tell you, and let me say this too. Part of learning. It's for an individual to feel comfortable enough to make mistakes. And I mess up with this with my son. I mess up with this with my children. And, you know, when I'm going through these proverbs, I'm actually thinking about shit that I go through. Where I get upset because they make a goddamn mistake. And I'm still, because I have been, how can I put it? In a sense, 
Failure for us in this culture, in America, has always meant pain. We only get one chance. One chance. And in that one chance, right, we don't get no more. Whether we're going into business for ourselves, whether we're trying to go to college, whether we're trying to start a business, in most cases, we get one opportunity. And that has been ingrained in our culture, where we throw, where we will throw our own selves or allow other people to throw us to the side because we fail. You know why? Because failure with us has always been connected with severe punishment and pain. I want y'all to imagine this. You being out in a cotton field, and there's a certain amount of pounds that you got to get, and you don't get those pounds. It ain't like the day where you can go home and possibly come back to work. You know what I'm saying? No, they will send you home with lashes on your back. They would, You know what I'm saying? There was no, no failure was allowed, family. So we, we through, the, through time, this trauma has been passed down so that when we're dealing with each other, we are as severe as some of those slave masters was on those plantations. Many of us, we come into situations already thinking that everybody is supposed to be where we are. And in doing that, we rob them of an opportunity to get better. Because they messed up. They made a mistake. They overstepped their boundary. We do it with our kids. We do it with ourselves. So for me, when I'm looking at this, the season of failure is the best time for sowing the seeds of success. When else can you sow the seeds of success other than on a plowed land of failure? When else? You know what I'm saying? So we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to look into ourselves and start giving ourselves permission to fail. Permission. You know, and you know, what, a, you know what a failure is? Let me, let me tell you how we look at it and how other people look at it. In science, they call failure an experiment. Brother Shaka's on the line. What's up, Brother Shaka? I know you've been holding back, man. What's going on? Man, let me tell you something. Not only do we have to give ourselves permission to fail, we need to give ourselves permission to fail all by ourselves. Because the only failure is the one that you don't learn from, that you don't increase from. And, you know, when you... uh. When you keep failing the same way over and over again, that part is just called stupidity. And when you look at the same traps that, that's been set for ages, and we keep falling into that same trap, that says a whole bunch about us as a people. So if we're not ready to change the way we think, what we say, and what we do, to hell with it. We just got to move without you. Anybody so, else? Oh, you know. Sorry. Go ahead, Shaka. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Hey, anybody else? Any other comments? Any posts anybody want? You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. Because there it go. Right there. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, it's, it's about us sharing perspectives. This is this is what we call in Giambi sharpening the sword. We put our heads where we, where we got our swords out and still sharpening steel. Right? We we out we, we thinking. We got to think about this. One more time. The season of failure is the best time for sowing the seeds of success. Family. <laughs> we are in a position of failure. Generations and generations of our people have suffered. I mean, family, we I mean just right now, I'm, I need y'all to understand. We are in the place of legends. Because we got all of the we got all of the experiments in the past. I ain't gonna call it failures. We got all the experiments of the past that we could look at, analyze, and apply that wisdom right now to correct our course. To be successful. You know what I'm saying? Because nation building hasn't stopped. And it ain't it had just because we put a, a label on it, it hasn't just began. It's been going on ever since. Ever since we landed here. Actually before we landed here. You understand what I'm saying? So now it's time for us to grow. 
We're sitting in the fields that have been plowed by our ancestors' failures. Thank you, ancestors. All we got to do is be the seed that we are. But then now, another piece come with being that seed. Metaphorically, in order for a seed to grow, the seed has to die first. I know some of y'all, that's, that's spooky to you, because some of us don't even want to get old. Sister Heather say, failure is the best teacher, and, and um, Ashaka alluded to that as well. You know what I'm saying? The only time that is truly failure is when you don't learn from it. When we, so let's change the language. It's not, we don't have to call it failure no more. We call it feedback. We call it experimentation. When scientists do an experiment, experiment don't work, they look at step A, they look at step B, they look at step C and be like, all right, cool, we're going we're gonna to scrap step, we're going to scrap step B, we're going to move and we're going to do step A, C, and D. Or we're going to make adjustments on step B. And we need to learn how to look at each other's lives like this and we need to start learning to look at, each, look at our own lives like this because we're all in this laboratory of life. Because, I mean, what else is it other than an experiment? If we, if we believe that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, it is nothing but a laboratory. We're soul beings. You understand what I'm saying? So, we're getting feedback from life. And right now, man, and what's so beautiful for us, man, is that the position we're in right now. See, family, and I got to stress this to you. We are in a time of legends this we are in a time of heroes right now right now we have been born every last one of, her, of us has chosen to manifest in this time right here and now because this is the opportunity to make changes that we've been talking about for generations and my goal is to be one of those that that our children are talking about and i hope that's your goal because hey because it's almost like we got to do it now. Right? All right. So now we're going to move on to the next one. Sister Tracy, you was the second on the line. You got a choice between one and three. Let me see. Um, one and three. Let me see. You still there, Miss Tracy? Uh, I'm still here. Choose between one and three. I think it's right. And I picked that she's going to say number three. Was I right? Man! Got another one. Oh, man, it's incredible. I mean, oh! I can read minds. I can read minds. So she said the third one. Gossip is like a disease. Once you have caught it, it is hard to get rid of. Man. Gossip is like a disease. Shaka, you want... Shaco and Miss Tracy, y'all want to go first on that one or y'all want me to hit that one first? Because that one don't might not even need. You can go ahead. All right, Shaka, you want it? I'm turning it over to you if you want it. You know what? I think I will. And I, right now, I'm just really... Uh, now, can you say it one more time because I was dealing with some uh, difficult difficulties. Say that again. You was dealing with what? I was dealing with some difficult difficulties. Oh, okay. You got that was good because I wouldn't have been able to say that twice. Gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Gossip is like a disease. Once you have caught it, it is hard to get rid of. Yeah. Bad habit. Mm. Bad habit. You might want to talk about the rubber bands after I get off of this one. The uh -oh. thing is, is that sometimes we get into these behaviors. And this is what I want y'all to know, good people. All behavior. And, uh, you know, when we deal with, like, mental disorders and, and things like that, if we claim it, we empower it because we believe in it. And we believe that this is our affliction. So we look at the process of how do people with this disease deal with things? Or how, how, how do other people with this disease uh act. And then when you look at when you look at that, even if you uh even if that ain't necessarily your affliction, you looking to be guided out of this place or you looking to, to be accepted within it. And that's kind of what gossip is like. 
once you get into, you know, let me get real with y'all. Like, I know somebody. Uh-oh. Or I knew somebody. He's gossiping. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that got this, uh, you know, back in the day, if you talk too much, you would get what they call a squealer scar. You know, that's what they gave rats. That's what they gave, and, and usually, like, people that don't know how to control their tongue, they was the ones that got this. And that's when you take a knife and you put it in somebody's mouth and you slit the side of their face from the inside out. And it makes them remember every time they open their mouth, be mindful of what you say. And, uh... <laughs> I'll be honest, if uh, if gangsters were as integral today as they were back then, from the head down in this nation, we'd be seeing a whole bunch of slave, uh, faces slip. So, <laughs> the truth is, is that it's easy to fix your behavior, good behavior, bad behavior. If you want to transform a bad behavior to a good behavior, pay attention this is easy to do. If you understand that every behavior starts with a thought, everything in life around you, when you look around the room, everything in, in the place that you're in right now started off as a thought. And, then, you know, and that idea became something that somebody talked about, even if they only had the conversation with themselves. And then from that, became an action behind it, and it manifested itself. And after it manifested itself, it became a behavior. Everything that you do, and if you identify a bad behavior that you had, it's very simple to fix. All you have to do is change your thinking. But you think becomes your words, becomes your action, becomes your behavior. That's what people see, is a behavior. So even before you say anything to me, I don't already recognize your behavior. And if I, and I, if I see that rhythm in you that I've seen in another, it's a whole bunch of conversations we ain't got to have. It's a whole bunch of things that we ain't even got to talk about because that initial behavior, that initial rhythm that you had, like for example, I'm a musician, singer, songwriter, when I'm on stage, it's my bandstand. You're a musician that is performing with me, even jamming for the first time. If all you know is three chords, be very careful of the way that you play those three chords. If you are mindful and respectful of my bandstand, you'll gleam when I want you to gleam. You'll shine when I want you to shine. But just keep those three chords out of the way from the major conversation because that's what music is. It's a conversation. But if you're the kind of person that don't even want to make eye contact with me, you just want to strum these three chords over and over again, and we're dealing with some jazz musicians that's having a, a, a whole different sophisticated conversation because in jazz, we play in like 50 different, you know, maybe not, we, but we play into a song form. We maintain in this conversation the way that it should be. And if you just want those three chords to be heard at some point in time, I might just unplug your act and go tell you to have your own conversation elsewhere because you ain't paying attention to what's going on here. Imagine if we had chuckers on our, our greatest uh, our songs that we like listening to, right? Imagine if you had a garage band artist playing along with John Coltrane. Anybody in their right state of mind tell you, man, get that dude the fuck out of here. It's offensive. It's offensive when you come into the, the place with, with three chords that you got under your hand and you will not have the will to, to learn anymore. If you're on a bandstand with me, that either means that A, you believe in what the, the message that I'm presenting, or B, you are willing to learn. But if you're coming up with those three chords and you think that that's the that's that's showtime of the night, so you're playing those 
three chords like you a rock star. You playing those three chords like it's more important than the message that I'm saying. Man, you will get unplugged, and you will not be invited back in. And my people, that's how I feel about us, is that sometimes we step into a conversation that's a lot more evolved than we give it credit to, and we think we're just going to do some trap music on top of it. And take that trap music back to wherever you came from. You understand? Shaka, so, I'm kind of offended, man. What? I'm kind of offended. I'm kind of offended. You know what I'm saying? Because I came on your bandstand, and I played three chords. And I'm just now feel, finding out how you felt about the three chords that I was playing because I thought I was jamming. I don't appreciate you. Man, let me tell you something about Tim. You're giving yourself a lot of credit <laughs> with those three chords, okay? But here's the thing. You came on the bandstand with those three chords. Did you believe in the message that I was sending? I couldn't hear your message. Are I was you... playing the three chords. <laughs> no, you wasn't. <laughs> Stop playing about playing. But yeah, y'all, that's what it is. And some people will get offended. And guess what comes out of that? You walk away, and now you've got to have a conversation with self. And years later, maybe something that happened within that conversation with self resonated with you, and it made you feel empowered to get back on that bandstand with me to be able to express what you learned. I like how, I like how, you, I like how you looped it back into the previous proverb. That's dope. That was dope, Shaka. That was dope. You looped it all the way back into uh, the season of failure is the best time for sowing the season of success. But a person first has to know that they fail. They have to know that they ha there's a struggle. And what you say, sometimes people get up and only got three chords playing with people with 50 chords and think that those three chords are equivalent to what the, fit, what, what the other ones are saying. We all we all experience that, but then I also like how you tied it back into talking about not just gossip, but other other behaviors, right? Because you, I mean, you you made you you took gossip and you expanded gossip and started talking about bad behaviors, unhealthy or unbalanced behaviors, right? And it's like those behaviors are like a disease, especially when when we. When we don't know we got them. Because diseases are real dangerous when you don't know you have them. A lot of our people are suffering from stuff that they don't know. Physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, um, intuitionally. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're suffering from things because we don't necessarily have the language to even describe it. Like, for example, I have emotional issues. And a lot of times I can't even describe the emotion I'm feeling because my whole life I've been trained basically as a man that the only emotion that I really am allowed to feel is anger. So right now I'm still in the process of trying to learn what different emotions feel like. You understand what I'm saying? Because I, I did learn to speak the language of feelings because I wasn't allowed to do that. So... I didn't until I recognized that disease of not being able to really monitor my feelings. I wasn't able. I wasn't able to diagnose the problem or even know that I had a problem. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of people don't even know they have certain issues. Don't even know it. So this disease is tearing up their life. So gossip being one of them. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times people don't know. And one of the things that we do is that. Because we might not want the conflict, you know what I'm saying? Because this is one of the, one of the things I noticed about, about Shaka in, in interactions with him. Shaka will say shit, something to piss you the fuck off. But one of the things that he lives by, he says, what you fail to learn at my expense, adversity will teach you. Right? And a lot of us, we avoid those conflicts because, you know, it's something that you know you need to point out to somebody, but you know they might they might not be ready for it. Then you got those individuals like Shaka that don't mind exposing that to. And a lot of us, we might need to take some pages because many of us in nation building, 
We have to, in nation building and becoming warriors, we have to be able to help people see themselves. Because what we got to remember is that most people don't know themselves, so they don't know what they're afflicted with. So when they come to you in order to help them, you might have to confront, you might have to confront them with the with, with, with what you see. Because in, in, in many people's, I mean, check this, this is what's crazy. We are other people's mirrors. So what they see, what they see about themselves, what they know about themselves, they usually got from the people around them. So usually somebody that's running around with a disease have been, has been uh, disserviced by their community. They, they, they haven't received the proper service or respect of the community because what is respect? Going back, going back to the definition of respect. What is respect? Respect is seen again. When we're not really honest with somebody, when we're not really helping them to see themselves, we're not really giving them the respect because we're not really seeing them. We ignore them. Let me try that. I'm tagging you. You tag. know, the thing about the process is that if you don't practice it yourself, that is what screams in the, in the ears and the eyes of those who are paying attention to you. I, at 40 years old, decided to go back to school and to take up jazz theory. And in doing so, and understand this, you know, that I've been a messenger for as long as you've known me. I've been creating music, producing music, writing songs for as long as I can remember. I graduated from Cleveland School of the Arts, so I took music theory, and I was able to decipher music. You show me some sheet music, I can't play along with you in real time. But I understand it enough to be able to sit home and decipher it myself and eventually be able to play the, play the song, a recording of the song, while I'm looking at the book and figure out where we at in the song. Oh, that's a... That's a C minor, or that's a D9, and all of that. And it's like, you know, I can decipher it. It takes me to, you know, I'm in my decipher music for a long time was just like doing math equations on each course. What does that mean? You know what I mean? And so by the time I reached the classroom, I got this old cat, and I'm going to shout him out, Steve Venos, because this motherfucker pissed me off. He's the head of the jazz studies department down at Tri-C. And I took his class. And the more that I, you know, and you got to take his class to, to, to finish the coursework, right? And so, uh, you know, but he's one of those people. He's, he's, you know, what I realized is he's a lot like me. And in this classroom, you know, it's Eno's world. And uh, he'll be like, uh, you know, one of the first things that he said to me, it resonated the first time. And he never had to repeat it again. But he said, you know, says, uh, if you never learn your, your major scale, you'll never be a great musician. Right? Never learn your major scales, you'll never be a good musician, a great musician. Is that the basics and, uh, of music? Base, yeah. The, okay. the, the, the foundation of, uh, you know, of jazz theory. And so uh, I'm like, all right, all right. And then I'll, I'll turn in some of my work, and he can, and he'll say, I can tell you didn't put the time in. I'm like, is the question, is the answers right? And they, yeah, for the most part. But the, you know, the difference is where you make your mistakes. That lets me know you haven't put your time in. It's like because the thing is that when you learn theory, you're learning numbers and shapes. It's not even about the music anymore. It's about the numbers and the shapes that's on the paper. If you don't know how to translate those shapes, and you don't know when they change, then you're not learning theory for real. And everything becomes more complicated because you're just winging it as you go. Right? So at one point in time, I don't know if it was because of a grade we were having this conversation or there's accommodation that I was looking for and he wasn't willing to... But we had a conversation in his office, and he brought that up again. He said, you know, if you're not a, uh, if you don't know your major scale, you'll never be a great musician. I said, you know what? 
when I'm on a bandstand, it is my bandstand. But whoever's on the bandstand with me, they follow me. Because I think the thing is, this is what he said. He said, if you never learn your major skills, nobody's going to invite you on their bandstand. I was like, yo, whenever I'm on stage, it's my bandstand. And so the piece is, is that in that, he had to respect to an extent that I'm a messenger and an artist before I'm a musician. And I had to accept that too, if I wanted to accept that. And the whole piece is, is that the conversation that I took home is, hey, on your Facebook, when you say, I'm a musician, do you really mean that shit? Because if I, if, if, if I, if I wanted to, you know, own that, then I would just take Steve Vino's advice, learn my major skills, and be able to play along with some Coltrane shit like it's, it's nothing. Right? Be able to play along with Eddie, and we can have a more profound conversation. But Eddie doesn't keep... Eddie has been uh, my tenor player for over 15 years and has never had a, 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 a problem with the conversation because he understands the conversation because he believes in the conversation, because he's willing to learn more about the conversation. That's the thing about Eddie, man, is that if you've ever had a conversation with Eddie him, Bear. he can correlate every, yeah, Eddie Bear. He can, he can correlate every jazz artist with every hip hop artist that has, and, and, and really create a parallel between the worlds based on some real shit. You after you told me and that not after you told me that I caught I I saw Eddie and I I tried to stump him. I said, "All right, Eddie, uh, I heard that you can correlate um, every jazz musician with a hip hop artist." He said, "Well, I, you know, I try, you know, because he, he's real humble." I said, "Okay," I said, yeah. "I said Rashawn Roland Kirk." <laughs> <laughs> Rashawn Roland Kirk. He said, he said, man, damn, that's a tough one. Hold on. If if I had to do with Sean Roller Kirk, I would have to say, old dirty bastard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, I hear you. I get you. Yeah, uh, shit, I can say that. You know what I'm saying? But those that you have to though you have to hear Rashawn and really understand. But bringing it back to the proverb, gossip is like a disease. So Shaka basically broke it down into bad habits. Rather than just gossip, because we know gossip can be a bad a, a bad habit. Now, because like I said, in everything, everything is a double-edged sword. So you got good gossip, you got bad gossip. You got too much. Too much of one thing is good for nothing. Some of us live our lives vicariously through listening about other people's lives and, and, and just listening and not really helping some people find the solutions that they need because we're trying to avoid the conflict. But if we don't have the conflict... There's no growth. You understand what I'm saying? Because the only way that I know how Tim in many cases. Now, I'm trying to do some intro, introspection on myself. I'm getting up and I'm and I'm doing stuff like this. But a lot of us don't. A lot of our people don't do these type of discussions. So the only reflection that they have of themselves is what we present. What we present. What we give them. What reflection we give them back. And if we refuse to give them a true reflection, we have to ask the question, do we truly respect them? Are we really showing them the respect that we say that we have for our people? Are we showing our people? Are we showing our um, legacy the respect that we say we have? We got to be clear about that. All right, so now, without belaboring the point, Ms. Tracy, you got something you want to say to that? Yeah, um, what I thought about when we brought up the um, the quote, I thought about um, the the um, the poster that we have in the library where it talks about success, successful people talking about um, that successful successful people talk about ideas where unsuccessful people talk about other people. Mm. Uh, mm. That that. That is becoming a disease, I thought it was really the catch right there, because if you think about it, 
once you fall into that mindset of talking about other people, the gossiping and so forth, how successful are you at that moment? And mm. then, and and how far does that go? So you realize, like, wait a minute, let me retract. You know, so it happens. It happens to the best of us. But like you said, you know, what are we? You know, if we're gossiping, if we're um, if we if we do have things that we need to say. Maybe we need to bring it to someone else, to, to that person to uplift instead of making it, you know, like a negative vibe. It could be a, a, it could be a positive vibe. And one of the key pieces in our community, right, in our community, like because we talk about building tribe, one of the things that we used to have back in the day was everybody had a mentor. So if you can't directly take it to the person, Maybe you might need to find that person's mentor, that person's master, or that person, somebody that that person respect, and possibly, yo, you know, you might need to talk to them about this. Because a lot of times, people might not be able to take what you have to bring them. So sometimes, like I said, it is wise to avoid some conflicts, but some of us are in the position of teachers of many people. We're involved in many people's lives, and whether we know it or not, they may be looking up to us. So we owe it to all those who are investing the humbleness in us, investing their respect in us, investing their time in us. We owe it to them sometimes, or maybe all the time, the ones that you are personally responsible for. Like, for example, one of the things in Jama we talk about is sponsorship. Everybody that I sponsor in, I'm responsible for for at least five years. So... You know what I'm saying? I, shit, I'm checking. You know what I'm saying? Those people that that's part of my family, shit, I'm checking. We we yo, we sitting down, we falling out, we arguing. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I I need them to understand that their success is my success, and my success is their success. And we're able to build together because right now, what's going on with us in Columbus, as far as Giamme, is incredible, man. I mean, it's it's incredible. And what do I mean by that? I mean that. Every day, I'm able to wake up and look at my family. Not just my children. I'm able to look at my brothers. I'm able to look at my sisters. I'm working with my family every day. I'm working with my tribe every day, with members of my tribe every day. Every day. Right? And I'm like, yo, I'm blessed in that way. But it ain't just that it was luck. It ain't just that... It ain't just that I hit the lottery. It ain't just that, you know. No, this shit is years in the making. You know what I'm saying? And it took me some time sitting down with somebody and having the difficult conversation. It took some time for me to, to you know what I'm saying, for, for me to help somebody figure out that there's a disease there that is not only going to stop them because now, because you and my tribe, if you got the disease, that shit is contagious. We got to kill that right now. Right? Many of us, we're not looking at our tribes, family. We're not. We're allowing shit to go on in our tribes that are, that's very contagious and very dangerous. And it stops the forward progress. It stops the growth. Because the disease sit up and eat up and dissolve. It eats up and grinds away resources. Yeah, anybody else got something you want to add to that? Elder Alona, you, you, we cool? Yes, uh, we, we're cool. There was one thing I did want to say, um, and it's kind of relating to number two. We need to provide a place, a safe space for our children to fail, a safe place where there is no penalty. And no, I tutor, and that's one of the things that I will tell my students. When you're with me, you have the opportunity, because it's safe, if your answer is wrong, or if you don't feel good about what you're doing, there's no penalty. There's no lashes if you don't pick enough cotton. This, so we just always need to provide a penalty free environment for our tribe. And when we talk to each other, 
about, say, the one Shaka talked about bad behavior, where we talk to each other about, when you know, you're gossiping or something like that, we do it in a no penalty way, you know. This is, you can say it, uh, I'm just telling you because I love you, or something like that. Just a, a penalty free environment where we can, where we can grow, because sometimes we don't have that space. Can I, can I speak on that, Elder? Yes, please. That space already exists for each and every one of us. And I could say, in one word, adversity. However, I can explain it better. You know, my son, I'm very overprotected. I, 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 I get it. I, you know, some people, well, I'm protected by them, all right? Um, and the other day, he wanted to go visit a friend, and his friend is a son of my friend. And uh, you remember uh, brother uh, Malek? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's my boy. Yeah. How is he? How is he yeah. doing? Man, he, he he's great. You know, he's he's doing the CCW training and things like that. And so, you know, he's got a son that's nine, and Pharaoh is seven, and these these boys want to call themselves best friends now. <laughs> you know? So uh, yeah, I take them over to his house, and they playing upstairs or whatnot. And then when they come downstairs, they wrestling and kicking each other and stuff like that. And I'm like, whoa, 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 <laughs> Pharaoh, you know, that boy is slightly bigger than you. And, you know, it, and as much control, like I, I saw him out the side of my eye. He makes me proud sometimes. I saw him out the side of my peripheral, man, in carpet and in socks. He did this Michael Jackson spin and did not stop spinning for like three rotations and I'm like Malek said you know before I could even say anything he was like yeah I saw it too I saw it I saw it just don't say nothing you know and then they uh they, they go to fighting again and I'm thinking in my head like man what if he you know accidentally you know break his arm well then he's just gonna have to learn and I have to I have to let up and accept that that's going to happen whether I like it or not and we will have to grow from that. And that's that's and so I say. Oh, go ahead. No, and that's why, like, yeah, in, in rites of passage, what you notice, right? And, and when you go and you you do research on rites of passage, one of the things that you that you notice is that a lot of young men are not initiated by their fathers. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? It's like because the father, like, either the father could be overbearing overprotective and it stops the child from being able to experience that failure to be um, experiencing that pain experiencing that you know what i'm saying because sometimes we have to deal with some of that stuff on our own so that because those things those failures allow us to get get a, a clear vision of who we are and a clear vision of where we are in the world you know what i'm saying so in a sense the penalty the penalty-free piece is there from us and our judgment. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, for example, you see this with children. When when my, when, when your kids are young enough, some of y'all that got children, you remember this, there will be a time when your child will be running and bump their head. And they will stop and they'll turn around and look at you. And whatever expression you got on your face, however you react, they're going to react because they're, they're, they're pulling yeah. off of us, right? They're looking for our perception. And and what, what we need to be able to provide is those environments where our children are able to make sense of the world on their own. And even for ourselves, because some of us, we don't, you know what I'm saying? We don't came up with going back to bad habits. We don't came up with the bad habit of applying other people's culture on where we should be in our lives, what we should be doing. You know what I'm saying? Somebody else's, the way somebody else is reacting to us matters more than what, what our people or what our family or our tri even our tribe thinks of us. So in many ways, we're living up to somebody else's picture. You know what I'm saying? And we're, we're, we're reacting using other people's means or ideas about where we should be and who we should be. 
rather than being able to, to, to do that ourselves. So in Rites of Passage, what they used to do is they would put you with an uncle or put you with somebody that's in the tribe that's not directly connected with you so that you can have your experiences. Still be protected, but have your experiences so that you can make sense out of it. Because that's where the growth starts to happen. Because really, it, it, it really for growth to happen, you need some form of conflict. You need some form. You need some form of conflict. Whether because the, the the greatest lesson, the greatest lessons that I have ever experienced in my life have been when I've been internally conflicted. When I ask myself an unanswerable question. When I, you know what I'm saying? When I was pushed up against an unstoppable or unbeatable force. You know what I'm saying? Or at least it seemed because right then I was setting my own limitations. And I was, I was thinking about how everybody else think about the problem. Rather than thinking about how I could deal with the problem. And speaking of that, let's go to the third one because I don't want to keep y'all up too late. Um... Doing easily what others find difficult is talent. Doing what is impossible for talent is genius. Anybody want to go first on that one? Because I'm going to tear that shit up. Tear, tear it up, throw it up in the air. Who is the most talented man in the universe? Or individual? I can't even, I can't even do it now. I have jaded from the beginning. Who in your world has demonstrated the most talent in their lifetime of being creative? I just put it like that. In my lifetime? Yeah. No, you know what? Let me just ask you like this. Who's the greatest entertainer of all time? Oh, Did man. You? This guy, man. This guy is incredible. He's... um. Been around the world. Um, he was the president of the International Man of Mystery and Leisure Club. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about none other than Brother Hatim himself. I, I'm just saying it like that. I'm sorry. I don't know what answer you was expecting. Asking me. You might want to ask Sister Tracy or Elder Alone. I, I got a lot of Anybody. Anybody. I mean, because no matter what your answer is, man, based on this proverb, they say what is what is done. Okay, say it one more time, I tell you. You ready? Hold on, here it comes. Doing easily what others find difficult is talent. But doing what is impossible for talent is genius. Okay, so what we're talking about is mastery. What we're talking about is mastery. And once again, I'm going to bring this guy's name up because he's the one that drove this point that in order to master anything in the world, it takes a hundred thousand hours. You say what? Somebody might say, well, I heard it. I heard it was 10,000. Okay, I sure was about 10, to say that. 10,000 hours to become proficient. 100,000 hours to become a master. So, for those who are truly... And, and when you look at the hours put into degree work, how many hours do you really put in to, be, uh, to, to get your bachelor's. I'm not talking about how many credit hours. I'm talking about how many hours do you really put in and devote to the understanding of that in which you, uh, you, are, you are studying. So, somewhere in, we you, become, about, you become proficient about somewhere the, around three, three, four hours. From the point that you fixed your heart and you said, this is what I want to be. Somewhere around How many three, hours did you put into it from around, that point? Somewhere around three to 4,000 hours for an undergrad. And how much for a master's? A master's, you might make it over 6,000. Uh-huh. 
So at what point do you truly trust trust that someone is a true master in your world? In my world? Mm hmm First off, I know many masters, and most of them don't have PhDs or masters. It's somebody that you can see. It's almost like in geometry, we got three levels of intelligence. We talk about um, memorization, intelligence of the mind, intelligence of the heart. A master at something, you can have a conversation with them, and they will be able to talk about or at least demonstrate what it is that you're talking about, regardless how complicated it is, regardless what field it is, they'll be able to relate it back to what they are good at. You understand what I'm saying? So a master is not even necessary. A master, you, you know it because you can feel it on them. They are the craft that they have been practiced. They become the craft. And you can see it in them. You can see it in their movements. You can see it in their actions. You can see it in their con. You can hear it in their conversations. You can feel it. You know what I'm saying? And that, you know what I'm saying? It's like we all been around certain people like that who has truly dedicated. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I don't know how many hours that take. You know what I'm saying? Let me ask you this. How many how many hours have you put into nation building? Shit. Dude. I've been on this path since I was about 13 years old. You can check back with my friends. I've been repeating and redoing the same shit over and over again. I just try to make it bigger every time. I've been, I've been this, who I am today, you know what I'm saying? I ain't going to say I'm the same as I was 13, but I'm still doing the same work. So, shit, since 13, shit, I got, I got well over 30, 30, I say between 30 and 50,000 hours doing this shit. I don't know if so, I here's gotta the do the math. Uh, uh, Kwame, I wanna make sure I'm, wait hold on, I wanna make sure I'm accurate. How many years is thirty to fifty thousand hours? Uh, so I gotta think about that. But go ahead. I put a lot of it. Yeah. So when you find yourself on a panel next to somebody who just a couple of years ago started YouTubing some shit about nation building and self mastery. And they sitting on the panel with you because they more popular. They may have had more influence in, in the world outside of yours. And you sitting on the panel with this individual who has become a, a, a YouTube guru. Mm -hmm. See, on paper, y'all might seem linear in practice. Well, that's where the evidence is at. <clears throat> and so, in practice, you might identify, you might not even identify with the standards that you maintain and that this individual is still learning. You're not paying attention because, you know, in, in, in your elevation and self-mastery, you've subdued your ego. So you just really focus, your, your scope is, 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 is so wide that this individual's ego may not even, even compute to you because you focused on the problem solving. You focused on the, the process. You focused on the fact that, you know, those who are entered into the process are supposed to be there. If this individual is not part of that process, you've been... You've been on this path so long, you don't even acknowledge his presence because he's not there. Now, I will I will have to disagree with you on this. Because one of the things that, that a master also has to maintain, or at least I believe, is a sense of humbleness and being able to learn from everybody. Because even a newbie's perspective, is good. One of the things I learned when I was doing Capoeira, one of the teachers told me, he said, when you start playing and you become, you get to a certain level, you always have to watch the beginners. I said, why? They're just beginners. He said, because you never know where the kicks is coming from. They're not following 
the same rules and the same laws that you've been. So they might come up with something totally new out of just necessity. You know what I'm saying? And it's like the same thing with, with somebody who has just started nation building. They might have some information that I could use. And part, of, and part of the piece that I have to be able to demonstrate is that we may have to learn some stuff from our children. We may have to learn some, st uh, some stuff from somebody younger that may be sitting on a path. I wouldn't say that they're not, you know what I'm saying, they're invisible. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to try to listen because they might be hitting on some shit that I may have been missing. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? So even in uh -huh. mastery, you have to have that humbleness because you have to be able to learn from everybody because uh, matter of fact I had a, I had one of my sons I told this story before I had one of my sons um and mm -hmm. he became a, a, a he was a blood I don't know if he still is he was a blood and um he went to he went to jail and when he came out he was a blood so he wouldn't even say the color blue you know what I'm saying they didn't say flu or you know, I'm sitting up here talking to him. I'm like, damn, you grown now? You, We on this shit? Is this for real? So, you know, I, and he been through my process. You know, I'm sponsoring I'm, you. You you, my son. I'm sponsoring you in into our family, and this is what you bring me back? So I'm listening to him, and he got a lot of good points that he picked up from them. But then I asked him this question. I said, I understand you were blood right now. But if God decided to communicate with you in the color of blue, would you accept the message? He sat back in the seat. He said, you know what, Baba, I'm a, I'm a, I got to think about that shit. So he ended up going back to prison. And when he went to jail, he sent me a letter. And the letter started off, Pops, I was thinking about the question you asked. I won't get what answer he gave, but I want y'all to think about that. You understand what I'm saying? Because oftentimes, the very lessons that we need are coming from a place that we would never expect them to come. And I think that's the true test of mastery. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, we got to be able to pick up the message, even if it is with something that we might view through our lens as disgusting. But the creator and wisdom lies everywhere, and we got to be able to extract that from wherever we are. And once we be, get to a point where we feel that we are so elevated that we can't learn, we got a problem. We got to really ask the question, is that mastery? You know what I'm saying? Is that mastery? Is that, is that truly self-mastery? If I can't, you know what I'm saying, when my kid, you know what I'm saying, I, I, I tell Cleve, I said, you know, one of the major things you taught me in my life was the importance of a seatbelt. Now, I have been sitting with grown folks for a long time, but until Cleveland told me that I need to put on my seatbelt and why, I could have been a, an adult. Like, you can't tell me what the fuck to do. You my son. I'm listening to what he got to say, and he taught me a very important lesson. Especially since I fall asleep when I'm driving. It made perfect sense. We all need to put on our seatbelts. You're right. So we got to be able to expect wisdom from un unfamiliar places. Right, right. Now, the, the, the piece that I was alluding to was the difference between an operative and a speculative. If you have been an operative on this path for most of your life, then you understand the rhythm of the process. The rhythm of the process. Someone who has devoted two years to learn from a speculative nature, meaning you know, through other people's experiences, they've never put themselves into the rhythm of the process. So in mastery, what you have taken is that when you hear a crescendo, you know what comes next. 
When you hear a silence, you know here comes the crescendo. When you hear the thunder, you know how to time the lightning. All someone from the speculative understanding understands is that where there's thunder, there's lightning. But you know the rhythm of that because you've lived through it. And you have experienced it so many times that when a thunder claps, you know how to synchronize your own rhythm with the rhythm of the universe. Someone who is only learning from a speculative understanding is not paying attention to that. Did someone just hang up? Yeah, that was Sister Tracy. She about to go to, you know, we got, we've got to get up. But go ahead, because I want to, I want to, go and finish so we can go on and shut this down the proper way. Yeah. All right, family, so, yeah, so, go ahead. That was it. That was it. Go ahead. All right, family, so now, one of the things that Dr. Kelsey often talked about was he has this I am a genius uh, piece, and he used to talk about bringing the genius out of our children. What I want to do, I want to plug this one in, doing easy what others find difficult is talent. Doing what's in, what is impossible for talent is genius. And what we want to bring, what we need to bring out of our children to move to the next level of where we are is that genius. Being able to look at what's impossible for talent. Because I want y'all to think about this, because the position we are in as a group, talent is not going to be able to get us up out this shit. We need genius. So we need to be able to cultivate and pull that genius up out of our children. But if we got to tie it right, we're going in a cycle, we got to tie it right back into that first proverb and go right back to what Elder Lona said by providing a zone where our children can fail safely, where we can fail safely and master our skill. Master our skills, right? Bringing it right back around to being able to heal those behaviors that take us off our path. Straight cycle. But family, listen. I want to thank everybody for joining me on the journey tonight. I want to give Shaka. Um, uh, well, actually, let's let Elder Alona give some fair parting words. Then we're going to let Brother Shaka. And then we're going to shut it down, family. And first, well, before we do that, Heather, Miss Heather was going to us. Because I know who you wanted me to say. Miss Heather Ann Haynes out of Chicago said Michael Jackson. That was the answer to your, to, 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 that I think that's who you wanted. And I wasn't going to give it to you. I wasn't going to say it. Brother Kwame did the math. 30,000 hours, 24 hours a day equals 12,050 days equals 365 days in years, 3.43 years. But I ain't going to do the 24 hours. I'm going to break that down until I got to break that down. I, I would say, I would say maybe eight hours a day, maybe 10 hours a day. I don't know. Not a full 24 hours, but thank you to Brother Kwame. Uh, Brother Nuba says, Shaka, so how is the progress on the June event coming along? So maybe that, maybe that might be what you might want to, well, hit that real quick. And then, well, better yet, Mama Lona, do you have some closing yes. words for us? Let's just continue to act and speak like we love ourselves. Mm. Mm. All right, Shaka. It's on you. So what you gonna do? I'm gonna tag team off of the will. I'm gonna take that even a step further and say to everyone in La Gat, me, I am the other you. To cause you harm, but to cause myself harm. And the flip side to that coin, the duality, is I love you like I love myself. Um, and with that, Brother Nubis asked about the June event. And let me just say this, man. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to get two answers because... It's, it's two things that's resonating in my mind. Now, I know he's talking about J-U-N. And so what I am, uh, what I'm designing is a Midwest 
Fermented Food Festival Tour. And guess what? Once it's on, it don't end. Um, for those of us who are fermenting, like you, Hot Tim, like me, yo, this gives us permission to have regional batch parties. Mm. So you have a clientele down there. I'm establishing a clientele here. And at the end of the day, we should be always documenting when we have the conversations that go on in these events. I think that those conversations is what's going to draw more and more people into this culture of fermentation. Because they might hear something from me, but they're like, oh, man, you're only five weeks into that. You know, uh, one of the brothers, he asked me, he's like, well, where did you learn it from? I would like to meet that individual. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And the piece is, is that we need to constantly create opportunities for that to occur. I can dig it. Instead of saying, oh, man, we had this festival. You should, you should look up on YouTube when we did this thing. Man, no, let them encourage them to come to the next one. And on that level, we need to establish more frequency of these events. So doing a tour gives us permission to have one in Cleveland this month, have a batch party down in Columbus next month, come come over to, to uh, the city, to, to, to uh, the East Coast, and introduce it there if it's promoted right, right? Right. And keep it going. This is, this is what, this is the way that we should move because as you are, uh, you know, devoted to the documentation of of this journey, the Giyame journey, well, fermentation is part of that journey. So we need that to be documented too. Because what we're trying to do is show evidence that we have a philosophy that is going to strengthen and to fortify our pillars of our individual uh, um, foundations. And that comes from fortifying our physical well-being, intellectual well-being, economic well-being, as well as spiritual. So if we're not able to show evidence on a routine basis, we're missing out on a whole bunch of believers because of the rhythm of what's going on outside of us. We can look at this whole world like... You know, we all got part in this one major tune. If we don't rehearse for that part, when it's our time to shine, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Maybe you weren't supposed to be great at your own moment. But if you're not master in your own world, what are you? Mm. Mm. So he's talking about June... But we the the festival is actually uh, I want to make sure everybody understand. He's talking about having a fermenting festival where people who like fermented foods and understand the power of fermented foods coming together. So I just want to make sure that's clear. And the fermented food that we serve, because it is considered a food, is a kombucha product, but its actual name is June because we use raw honey and tea. Right? One more thing, I tell. I'm actually, uh, and I know this is a hot day for y'all. Y'all probably got to do well. I ain't going to say probably. On June 17th, we're going to be doing a Juneteenth artist. Uh, <laughs> That's hot. That's hot. I think I, might, right. I think I might be there for that. I'm on, you know what I'm saying? And here's the major reason why, man. It's because we treat, you know, the reason people regard slavery the way that they do is because we keep them out of the conversation. And so when Juneteenth come around, it's just us. Listen, Juneteenth celebrates a freedom that is what ties this whole daggone country together. So for us not to, I mean, not that, not to capitalize off of it, but yo, we're in America. 
What do you expect? If we don't, somebody else will. And so I'm saying that because we let hip-hop go. We don't own that no more. Juneteenth is the, is the last standing piece for us to pronounce our greatness in this month. So when it comes down to it, we need to be able to open up, open up where people outside of us feel comfortable celebrating freedom and most especially our freedom. And that, in essence, is the grandest brotherhood that we can have in this place of America. All right, family. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to tune in. I want to remind you that you are now listening to Giami Journey Media. This has been Tribal Quotes and it's a Heart of a Simba production. But we strive, strive, strive to blow up your old paradigms. And with that family, I am out. Because I was supposed to be in bed two hours ago. I'm out. Peace. Peace. All right, Spreaker, we out. Thank y'all for joining us. I hope that you got something from it. And if you did, please like and share because I'm trying to build up my family on Spreaker. I need your help. Help us recruit. We need to recruit. Yes, we do. All right, peace out, family. <laughs>